Welcome to Studio Chat, an entertainment talk show covering movies, TV, music, and more. Chelsea here with a special guest who's well known for his acting career, especially in the horror world. He's played a wide variety of roles in film and TV and now represents behind the camera with his own agency. Russell Todd, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Chelsea. It's great to be here. Thanks. Great to have you. So you've had such an interestingly varied career. You spent so much time in front of the camera and then quite literally stepped behind it to represent Steadicam and other camera operators. So let's start with yeah. your acting side first. You sure. set the tone in your career for the horror genre with your first feature film role in He Knows You're Alone. And I'm curious, did you have any thought initially to set out to act in horror films or was it more of what just kind of came across your path at that time? The latter. It really just came across my path. I mean, I would have loved to have starred in, you know, some big blockbuster thriller or action thing at first, but, you know, it was just starting out. And there was a um, backstage, there's a, a little newspaper in New York, I think it was in LA as well, where you would, actors would look at for auditions. And at that point, I didn't have an agent. And I saw this one uh, called He Knows You're Alone. And it was just a little part. Uh, but I thought, oh, I think it could be a great break. So I auditioned for it. And I did get it. Armand Mastriani was the director, a terrific guy who I know still today. And um, little did I know that, uh, well, I know, little did I know then, but even more importantly now that it was Tom Hanks' first movie. So, but I never worked with Tom. I just worked with this, with this, with this girl. And uh, we only worked one day in Staten Island. And um, funny enough, the way I die in that movie uh, is I'm strung upside down above the car and yeah, I don't know if it shows a, a slit throat or not, but but I'm dead. And in Friday the 13th, part two, I'm strung upside down and Jason slits my throat. So it's very funny that we have that happening in both movies. And those were the very first two movies I did. I was wondering, did I get a cast for Friday the 13th, part two? Because I, I do okay hanging upside down. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what the story was, but um, but I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, definitely an, an eerie similarity there, but uh, yeah, could, could be somebody yeah. saw that and was like, hey, I like the look of that. That's a good idea. Let's put that in Friday yeah. the 13th, right? He's good at that. <laughs> He's good at that. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, when when you look at credits for any film, you know, you'll you'll see there's so much, you know, makeup and wardrobe involved, but especially for horror, there's often an extra large makeup department, more hands involved for prosthetics and gore and whatever's needed, really. So what was the process for you getting into Scott's death scene there? I mean, upside down, mache the throat, it's gross stuff, but it's fascinating from a filmmaking perspective of, you yeah. know, what kind of prosthetics and things they had to do for that. Yeah, I was, I've always been fascinated by prosthetics. In fact, my good friend, John Caglione Jr., who won the Academy Award for the prosthetics in Dick Tracy, he did those, and um, he's done so many movies uh, throughout his life already. Um, Al Pacino, he's his, he's his makeup guy. Um, but John was called in to do the prosthetic, I believe, for me, and then Carl Fullerton, I believe, was the head makeup person on the film. Uh, so what they did is they cast uh, my neck in plaster, and once they had the mold, they, they uh, made a plaster piece for the neck, and they put that over me, and it was pre-slit. So no sharp knife had to, you know, cut it open or anything. And we know the story about that machete. But um, so it was pre-slip and inside of it was tubing. Um, and that was run down my chest, down my leg. I'm upside down uh, for this actual scene. So it was, it was run down my clothing and out my pant leg. So, you know, sitting around for the plaster cast, I think was an hour or something. And then having it applied maybe another hour. There's the different days, of course. Uh, and having it applied another hour or so um, and blended in with makeup to make it look like it's actually my neck. Um, and But during the actual shoot, which funny enough was on the last day of shooting. And I've told the story a few times before, but I, I love this story. So I'll say it again. You know, usually in a movie, they, um, they shoot out of sequence. It's just the way it is. It makes it easier for production uh, to line things up. But for some reason, I was in sequence and my last day was my death. And I remember calling my parents uh, in outside of Albany, New York. We were shooting in Kent, Connecticut and saying, it's my last day. Today's my death scene. I remember my mom saying, Russell, why did they wait for your last day to kill you? Are you sure this isn't a snuff film? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> wow. I said, well, it's Paramount Pictures. I don't think it's a snuff film. You know, the first one was a big hit. That's why we're doing the second one. And I, I think that everything is fine. So she was sorry about that. She was very cool about that. And uh, and we did the shot. And when we did it, you know, some uh, a stuntman is the one that caught up, caught up in the snare trap that pulled me upside down. So that's someone else's body, of course. But when they come in, what they had done is they 
put me upside down and, and uh, I was being held by a rope with my legs up above and I'm down, but they held my back up and my head up. So the blood wouldn't rush to my head for like 30 minutes or 45, whatever it was, waiting for the scene to take place. And the guy was up there in the tree and he had a big pump uh, full of blood. So on cue, he would just pump and it would come down the two and, and out the neck. And all I had to do was lean back and expose the the open slit, pre, pre-slit, pre you know? So I remember Steve Meyer saying, we really want to get it in one take because, you know, the, the mess, the clothing, the face, the makeup, everything, the, the appliance. So I'm like, oh, wow, we got, you know, it, it made me a little nervous, but we did get it in one take, which was great. And it got bloodier and bloodier as it went along. And so the blood was rolling into my eyes and I had to cut. Oh, wow. <laughs> and of course you don't see that, but the, the critics were really, um, not the critics, the um, uh, the censors were really rough on, on Friday 13th part two. They cut a lot of scenes uh, short uh, very quickly. So, you know, the blood starts running and it just gets a little onto my face really. And they cut right there. But in the re-release in the group set, uh, the box set of all the Fridays, uh, they've added extended footage, I believe. Ah, I we see more of that, but not to the point. I don't think where it gets into my eyes. <laughs> no, that wasn't pleasant for anyone, I'm sure, <laughs> especially you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it was a cool experience. I loved it, yeah. and the idea that my friend John Caglione was involved, who I grew up with, and he, in fact, my first experience with prosthetics was him um, making me up as Planet of the Apes. Remember those movies? Of course, yeah, fantastic. Exactly movies. like them, and me going to a Halloween party in New York City. And me showing up and people were like flabbergasted because, you know, when you move your mouth, your face, everything is exactly as if it was a real face, but as a, an ape. And uh, it was just amazing. So that was the first time he did prosthetics on me when I was just, I think, like 20, 21 years old in New York. That's so fun. Was he kind of just starting out with it at the same time? It was almost like was. practice for him. <laughs> we were beginning in high school and I would we would just do crazy things. We would show up in the the um, where everyone was eating lunch. And I would come in and he would squib me. He would have me little electrical charges on my chest underneath my shirt. And I'd come in and he'd yell like, look out. And suddenly I would, and blood would shoot out of me and I'd fall on the floor. And, and you know, it caused a problem sometimes where they would call us into the office. <laughs> but I think they got to know John and myself as the pranksters. But he would do all sorts of things with makeup with me in high school. And then, of course, he he met Dick Smith, who did The Exorcist. And, and, and he was his mentor and made John the amazing... Um, technician he is today that's really fun definitely you were yeah. both born to be in entertainment at that level that i think so I, I do believe that yeah yeah <laughs> that's fun and then when you were getting into friday the 13th part two where scott meets his gruesome demise had you seen the first friday the 13th and did you have some idea what you were getting into at that point yeah i did see the first um in fact we i had seen it but they also screened it for us again to be sure we had seen it and got the you know the flavor the texture of it um <laughs> But, you know, I knew what it was we were doing, and I enjoyed the first one very much. I was scared like everybody else. Um, but when I saw it, I never thought, you know, who, you know, when you see a movie, you never think, oh, well, they're going to do a sequel. You never know. But when I read that they were doing it, and I told my agent, you know, please submit me for this. And then I saw it also again in backstage, and I got the chance to meet Steve Miner. I, I was thrilled because I thought, wow, it did so well, the first one. Uh, it'd be terrific to be part of the second one. But even being part of the second one, you think, all right, well, this is finite. You know, this is it. You did your movie and it's done. But none of us knew, you know, what a franchise it would become and what legs it had. And um, even to this day, you know, when we all get together, we're just flabbergasted and thrilled how the public has taken to this franchise and really, you know, held it and and, and enjoyed it and has kept it going. So, um yeah, I was really happy to be part of the second one, but again, not knowing what was truly going to become, you know, of it. Absolutely. And it's it's ironic, actually, the fact that, you know, horror is so gory and gruesome and quite literally horror as a genre has such a warm community surrounding it. There's so many conventions and so much, you know, appreciation, so many, you know, podcasts and talk shows focusing on classic horror, new horror and everything. And there's just such a huge community surrounding it that people can enjoy these these terrifying scenes together. I don't know. There's it's yeah, something it's interesting so in that. And and it's growing. It's not diminishing as the movie gets older. It's because new generations are being exposed to it and other horror films. But, you know, I go to conventions and I meet the fans and, and it's exciting for them. It's exciting for us. Uh, and I love going to the conventions because I get to see my fellow castmates as well, which is another thrill. 
And we're, like I said, we're just all amazed by the energy and the love and the embracing of, of, of the Friday franchise. And um, it's just, it's un, it was just totally unexpected making it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of value. I mean, discussing the prosthetics and that process, I think that a lot of people are able to appreciate that, especially in this day of growing, you know, AI and CGI's and everything, yeah. which, you know, CGI has been around for a while. And there's a lot to that too, which can be, you know, really cool. But at the same time, there's something to that classic hands-on work and seeing yeah. the amazing artistry that somebody can come up with and like to do the makeup, prosthetics, everything. And I think for the actor too, to have the hands on, you know, when you're exactly. wearing a prosthetic or, you know, once I did a Western with Glenn Ford and when they just even applied the makeup and the dirt and they made me filthy out in, you know, out, out in the desert, you just feel more, you know, if that's ad, if things are added post, you know, or, you know, later on, uh, it's a very different feeling than working with the actual makeup and as clothing or anything else, you know, when it's on you, it becomes you and, uh, and part of you. And I think it makes a big difference. Definitely more of an immersive experience and probably easier to get into totally. the character because you feel more like that character. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So another uh, note of something you've done on a kind of much lighter note than the gruesome horror of uh, being killed the same way in two different movies. Uh, I also want to mention Where the Boys Are, 84, oh, yeah. which is a great fun, that movie. And it's another fun synchronicity, I feel like, because, you know, you had the same death in two movies and now you had the same name in two movies because you're also named Scott in that's Where the true. Boys Are. That's true, Scott Nash. But, yes. Yes. <laughs> but this Scott actually managed to stay alive, so that's good. Plus he wins and gets the girls, so, you know. It's we, good we, stayed alive until the, we stayed alive until the critics saw it. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. No, no, no. It's all but good. It's, all it's good. still, it's still a fun movie. I think it has a very distinct '80s touch, and a lot of people definitely, even if it wasn't appreciated as much at the time when it was first released, as you mentioned by critics, right, right. I think a lot of people have grown to appreciate it now, and and the distinct yeah. '80s feel and touch, and the fact that it's just at the end of the day a really fun movie to watch and experience. So, can you talk about some of your experiences right. in filming that leading man role? Sure. I mean, that was another, first I'll tell you how I got that role. I don't know if you know the story, but my picture, I had just moved to Los Angeles from New York. My picture was hanging up in the home of uh, a well-known celebrity uh, haircutter hairdresser named Jerry Esposito. And he, when I, everyone said, who, who cut your hair? I said, they asked, I mean, I asked, who should I go to cut my hair? I said, everyone goes to Jerry. So I went to Jerry Esposito. I think he was on Fountain Avenue near La Cienega. And he put my picture up around, you know, the mirror and Alan Carr went to him too. And Alan Carr sat down in that chair one day and this is what Jerry told me. And he looked at the picture and he goes, who's that guy? And Jerry said, Oh, he's new. He's just from, from New York. His name is Russell Todd. He says, that guy's going to star in my next movie. <laughs> I mean, it was like nice. a lot of Turner and Schwab's, which is not a real story, but uh, it's folklore. And I got a call. Uh, my agent got a call to uh, come in and read for Where the Boys Are. And I read with Lisa Hartman and we went back and forth and, and I got the picture. Um, and, you know, so here I have just have moved to Los Angeles and then I'm packing up and we moved to Fort Lauderdale, not moved, of course, I mean, just go to Fort Lauderdale uh, to do the movie for six weeks or eight weeks, whatever it was. And it was exciting and nerve wracking because it was the first, you know, big feature here and, you know, the lead in it or one of the leads. And um, so it was, I remember there being a lot of pressure. I remember High Averback and Alan both coming to me and saying, just relax, enjoy, have fun. You know, this is a terrific moment for you, which it was and something I'm very grateful for. And um, and we shot it. And, you know, it, it's a fun movie. So we laughed a lot on and off the set. Alan Carr, you know, known for his antics and his, you know, larger than life personality always kept us entertained. And um they, you know, in between shooting, they would do things like they brought us to, I don't know if it was SeaWorld or where it was, but they had us in a private session, get into a tank with dolphins oh, wow. and ride them. And so that was cool. Um, there were parties they invited us to go to. Uh, Lisa Hartman and I, every day, we somehow found time to go to a gym nearby and work out, which was fantastic. Um, I remember Alan Carr in the hotel room, he would have things going on at night parties and he would just order food, food, tons of food from the room service and just go, well, TriStar will pay. You know, he, he, he didn't seem <laughs> to care. There was, you know, TriStar will take care of it. So uh, it was it was a great experience. Um, a lot of fun during the show. My favorite moment 
was the concert at the end and singing to Lisa Hartman. Um, it was a giant amphitheater, not giant, but a big amphitheater in Florida, in Fort Lauderdale. And my parents came down from Albany to be there that night and, and watch me on stage sing this, this song to Lisa. That's so that was, that was that was a great moment to be performing in front of my parents. And um, and that went well. Um, so they're somewhere in the audience in the movie then. That's yeah, cool. they were. And, you know, and I made, you know, I could see them during it, uh, enjoying it, you know, my mom and dad beaming. So that was that was really a wonderful moment. But the whole picture um, was was. I said, as I said, there was pressure, but it was it was just a, a great deal of fun. You know, it's a light subject. You know, it's, it's a beach film, and um, uh, you know, we weren't making Hamlet, <laughs> right, <laughs> by Alan Carr, <laughs> but uh, but I'm very happy I was part of it. No, awesome. It's it's definitely it just has a fun tone to it. It's really it nice. doesn't take itself too seriously, and that may be no. the reason for what you said about you know staying alive until the critics got to you. I think you know yeah, which people is may have it's you okay. know people may have just kind of been expecting something different. But I think at the end of the day, it's it's just a lighthearted, fun film. You get a lot of laughs out of it, and yeah. you know that there's nothing wrong. That's a great genre, is you know light. Exactly light comedy that keeps you entertained so and, and when when we I talked about going to these fan conventions you know m most of the time I'm known from the horror and from a soap opera I did mm -hmm. but still tons of people come up and say how much they enjoyed where the boys are 84 and what laughed and they watch it over sometimes they have parties and friends over and they watch it or they had that experience in Fort Lauderdale themselves so so you know that's wonderful that's great. And especially now that hearing the stories of what Alan Carr did for you guys, he kind of gave you that Fort Lauderdale spring break experience yourselves. I feel like yeah, he, he just did. made it he a whole did. big he party. He made sure it was a fun time. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So also speaking of your moving to Los Angeles from New York, which is something I did myself, actually. I'm a New Yorker, <laughs> native, That's great. native Long Islander. Uh, so I've heard that you gave the studio tour at Universal Studios Hollywood for a time. <laughs> yes. And I'm someone who has a great love for Universal Pictures. I really appreciate the history of the studios and the theme park. So I just love to hear anything you can share of what you saw and did during your time there. Well, that was a great drill. And the way that came about, which is interesting, is Verna Fields, she won the Academy Award for editing Jaws. And when I was growing up, when I was eight or 10 years old, I was making home movies. I wanted to be Steven Spielberg. And I thought, I'm going to be Steven Spielberg. There's, there's nothing stopping me. So I remember one of the films I made was on my on the floor of our kitchen. And I put a map of the USA on it. And I had two plastic cars, one in California, one in New York. And I did stop animation. And I had them go across Route 10 or whatever the routes were. And they, in the middle of the country, they crashed and exploded. So, you know, I stop animated. And when I got to there, I put on kerosene or whatever. And I lit it up. And it was amazing. It just worked out fine. There was no real story to it. It was just you know, animation. I was Pyrotechnics at that. <laughs> Pyrotechnics, yes, at, at eight years old or nine years old. And <laughs> I removed the map and take away the cars and I burned a hole in the floor. <laughs> in the linoleum, you know, the linoleum was very big. And I, but I remember my parents freaking out over that. So we had to replace the linoleum. But that was the first one. But then I made a film when I was, I think I was 13 or 14 years old. I said, I'll do a Western. So I took cardboard and I carved out like um, the doors of a saloon, but out of cardboard. And I stuck them on the entrance to the den. And in the den, we had a bar anyway. Uh, so I put things on there, you know, the bottles and stuff. And I had all my friends come over and we did a bar scene and I added music to it. And I called it How the West Was Lost. And, you know, there's a fight scene, bottles breaking, um, you know, just and a little comedy in there. And so the reason I mentioned that is... I'm in, I'm in Syracuse University in the film program. Again, I want to be a film director, Spielberg. And I get this idea that I'm going to write Verna Fields and send her this movie I made. Oh, by the way, that movie won the Kodak Young Filmmakers Award when I was 13 years old. So I thought, well, maybe I got something going you know, here. So, so I sent that and some um, kind of experimental film project I made in my freshman year at, at Syracuse. So I sent them both to Verna with just a letter, hi, Verna, my name is Miss Fields. <laughs> I didn't call her Verna. <laughs> um, not yet. <laughs> not, not yet. Uh, my name is Russell. I'm at Syracuse University. And, you know, I want to be, you know, the next big film director. I love Steel and Sproul. Steve Sproul. I loved your work editing Jaws. Um, and I sent it off. Well, nothing happened. And then I go to my mailbox one day and there's a letter from Universal Studios. And I'm like, what's this? 
And I opened it, it's from Verna. And she said, dear Russell, I received your materials. I loved watching them. I love your enthusiasm. I would love to meet you. So I said, I wrote her back and said, I called actually, she gave a phone number. I said, could you come to the university and be a guest lecturer? We'll fly you out. I, I didn't know they would. But when I told the head of the department, they were thrilled to have someone like that come in. And they brought her in and she was the guest lecturer. Uh, she stayed for a few days. And she said, when you're ready to come to California, I'll get you a job at the studio. And at least you'll have a chance to watch films be made and everything. So I said, well, what? You know, and she goes, how about you just be a tour guide first and then you'll have free roam in the studio. And the other tour guides, no one had free roam in the studio. We were on the lower lot all the time, you know, giving the tour, but you couldn't get off or come later and, and watch production. She gave me that that uh, freedom. So I came out, I got the job during the summer as a tour guide at Universal. And I'll never forget, you know, back then it was MCA Universal, I think. And so I'm, I'll, I remember the beginning of the speech because you had to memorize everything. You had a book with notes, but you always had to, you know, memorize everything. And they wanted a pretty verbatim, except if there was a breakdown then you could, you know, ad lib a little, but it was, hey, Hi, my name is Russ, and on behalf of MCA, I would like to welcome you aboard the Universal Studios tour. On your left is Wom Poppers, which was a restaurant that was back there at the time. But I remember saying that so many times, at least four or five, four times a day. But I did the tour, I watched production, and um, I learned so much from it. Uh, but on the tour one day, someone said to me, are you an actor? And I said, no, actually, I, 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 here, I want to be a filmmaker one day, a director. They said, you should be an actor. And then someone else said, you should be an actor. And I spoke to my friend. They said, you know, what do you, what do you think? He said, why not? Try to be a commercial actor. So I hired someone to do photos. And um, not soon after that, maybe a month later, I had my first, not my first audition, but I had an audition uh, and I got the part for the commercial. So uh, I started thinking, I kind of like this. Maybe uh, I, I will be an actor. So I came back to New York. Um, I was still going to Syracuse University, but during a semester, I went to New York City and I got a job as a model. And all of a sudden I was off to Europe and, you know, in Milan, getting tear sheets and doing shows. And from there, I started doing more commercials and things. And um, <laughs> one of the commercials, there was a store back then called Corvettes. Uh, it was three Korean veterans who had put it together, two Korean veterans, and we called it Corvettes, K-O-R, it was the Corvettes. And it required me to be, to like, be talking with this girl and I snap my fingers and all of a sudden I'm, I'm in some Terry sportswear outfit in shorts. <laughs> and I have a scar on my left knee about this long from a tree going into it when I was building a fort when I was a kid. So I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of, this, of, the, of the scar because I had to be in shorts. So I go into the audition, I get to the audition, I have this great idea before I go that I'm gonna take some crazy glue and a little pair of scissors. And before I go in, I'm gonna cut some hair from my leg and crazy glue it onto that scar so it's not visible. <laughs> so I do that and then I come back out and it's looking great. And I come back out and it's just delay, delay, delay. It's like an hour later and, and they call me in and I'm in long pants um, and underneath have shorts. And so they said, let's see your legs. So we're, we're, you know, first I do the reading and they said, let's see your legs. I pull the pants down. I see all their eyes just go like this. And they're just staring down here. I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? And I look down and that crazy glue had dried bright white. So it drew <laughs> attention right to that. And they said, what's that? And I said, well, this is what happened. I explained exactly what I did. They said, you know what? You got the part. If you did that for us, you got the part. So that was, uh, that was actually the first, that's the way I got my union card. By that that's commercial, a, by crazy glue in your knee, who knew? By crazy glue in my knee, yes. <laughs> no, that's fun. That that's good. They recognize. They're like, okay, if this guy's trying to put that much effort, yeah, that into much it, effort then into it, he, yeah, we'll give he the really wants this. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, that it's funny how things just kind of play out, and you know, like yeah. that domino effect of you know, you just writing that letter of throw it out there. Let's see what happens. Never know. And the next and thing you know, you're at Universal Studios. <laughs> yeah, I think I always when people ask me what's the best advice you can give me, I say reach out, contact people, because you never know, even if you send out a hundred letters of one person responds, who knows where that will lead you. And it's frustrating because you don't hear back. Uh, you know, I didn't hear back uh, for a long time, but um, you know, you have to make uh, efforts like that and, and be proactive and you never know what will come from it. And uh, look what did, it was great.
Absolutely. And like I said, you've had such an interestingly varied career from the horror to the movies to modeling to also daytime television, because you also yes. found yourself steadily in soap operas for a few years with another world as Jamie Frame. So what brought you to that world, pun intended, and did you find it <laughs> easier or more challenging to do daytime television compared to film? Well, it's, it's very interesting. It's very different. Um, but I remember auditioning for it and I live in L.A. and that was shot in Brooklyn, New York. And at first I didn't think, you know, I didn't want to really go back to New York and do a show for three years. That was the contract. And I remember getting the call and, and excited and, and like, uh oh, here we go. New York for three years, which is a wonderful, fantastic city to work in. But I was very happy in L.A. at the time. So I went no back. Snow. <laughs> no snow. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I went back and um, I read with, you know, Anne Hayes, who unfortunately has passed since she was my girlfriend and the previous Jamie, they were married, but I was pursuing her character. She played Vicky and Marley twins. So Marley was the was my girlfriend on that show. Um, so I'm pursuing her. And as soon as I get to Brooklyn to start this role, I think within weeks, they had written that Jamie would fall in love with Marley in Nice, you know, in, in, uh, in France. So we end up doing a remote. So they fly the two of us uh, and, you know, the producers and the crew uh, to France to shoot this, which was did not sit well with the other actors because I'm the new guy, just arrived. No one's doing remotes anywhere, let alone in Europe. And they I'm whisked off. And I remember getting some, <laughs> some attitude uh, regarding that uh, when I came back. But, um, but it was a terrific experience going there and, and shooting and falling in love with Marley uh, in Nice. Um, except for one scene where we had to go, she, she just had, you know, she was just triumphant and, she, and Marley ran into the ocean in a, in, a, in a beautiful ball gown and I'm in a tuxedo and I go to save her and we're in there and the, and the water was cold, not as cold as the Atlantic, but cold. And, um, and I rescue and pull her out and, you know, we're, we're truly in the moment because she's, you know, flailing and I'm trying to rescue her and swim to shore and we're losing our breath and I have a wetsuit on underneath my tuxedo. Oh, so already wow. there's, there's pressure on like my- weighing up, you down, my, yeah. yeah. Not, not, not the sort of way, but the pressure against my lungs. And so we're coming out and and as soon as I pull her out, they, they'll cut and we're like, I could barely, I could barely get to my breath. Uh, they had to literally everyone just get the suit off and, and, and then, you know, unzip the, the wetsuit so I could breathe. I thought I was, I was going to pass. I could not get my breath. And the same with Andy. She, um, you know, she was just, <laughs> Uh, so it was, wow. it was quite a, a scene we had there. We thought at one point that it was gonna, we weren't going to make it coming out of that water. But uh, it was a great uh, couple of weeks uh, in Nice. And then coming back, I stayed on the show for three years. I played Dr. Jamie Frame. Um, the character never really was that exciting to me. You know, I don't know, maybe in previous years, maybe the, the biggest, um, the biggest, uh, excitement in his life was he was started to date his intern at the hospital you know I mean it was an interesting story but it, it was never anything I thought that was really exciting um and it kind of it didn't turn me off to acting but it kind of I lost some love because I prior to that I was playing so many characters an oceanographer a cowboy a a lawyer, all these things. And then you're, you know, the same character for three years. And don't get me wrong, it's a wonderful job for an actor. You know, three years on any soap, 50 weeks a year, making great money, you know, is fantastic training and a terrific job. But I truly enjoyed being different people and different roles. And so when I ended up doing that for three years, by the end of the three years, I was really looking forward to returning and, and getting back to being, you know, different characters once again. But I enjoyed the experience working with Carmen Duncan was always amazing. Unfortunately, she has passed away too, three, four years ago. Uh, John Aprea, um, uh, Matt Crane, Tom Eplin, uh, Anna Stewart, uh, a lot of them. There was just, you know, some terrific people there. And, uh, and it, it, it was a great experience. It really was. That's wonderful, definitely. And I, on the topic of daytime television, I recently had an interview with Mary O'Leary, who produced Another World for a few years, but I believe it was after you had left the show. But one of the things we were talking about was just the amount of work put into daytime television in general. Yeah. It's coordinating everything daily, short rehearsals, quick edits, dealing with right. last minute changes or mishaps. So as an actor, did you feel that sense of being part of this bigger machine of so many moving parts around you? 
Yeah. And, and and that truly your last question, I should have answered differently because that's exactly what you were looking at. What was it like in the difference between making a film? This is a factory. You're literally you're literally working for 50 weeks a year. You get two weeks off pretty much and you have to book them months in advance to get those weeks because they have to write into the story. Like when I was home here, in yes. Los I fell off. Uh, I was packing boxes and I was weighing them on a scale and I my ankle fell off the scale and I broke my ankle. So I called the studio immediately because I was in a cast. They had to write in the story, you know, a broken ankle and all of a sudden. So Jamie was playing tennis and broke his ankle. So, but, you know, 50 weeks a year, the call, you could either be doing the morning session or the afternoon session. So sometimes our call time would be 7 a.m., which means getting up at 5 a.m. Many of us lived in, in Manhattan, but they would have a car pick us up to be sure we got to work. So we get picked up at six, get to the studio at seven begin rehearsals, go right from rehearsals down to makeup and hair, get that done, go on um, and, and block it on set with camera and shoot. And then you may shoot all your scenes and go home or you may shoot one in the morning, hang around and shoot one in the afternoon or 10 scenes during the day or, or whatever it is. Uh, and if there was a, a special show like a Christmas show or a Thanksgiving show, you could be there from seven in the morning till two o'clock the next morning. And, you know, sometimes instead of going home and returning the next day, I would just sleep in the in my dressing room. So I wouldn't have to go through the you know the hassle of getting up early and, and, and coming back in uh, to Brooklyn from New York. But it was constantly memorizing. And that was a real lesson for me. At first, I just thought, I don't know how to do this. This is pages and pages. And as a doctor, sometimes, uh, you know, I was called into a court scene and just went on and on and on. And when I would do a surgery or something special, uh, you know, as a doctor, um, there'd be so many lines. Um, so you would take it everywhere. I would take it when I was in the bathroom, you know, it was just going, they say learning lines is best just as you're going to bed. It's come somehow cements in your head. So I always do it just before I go to sleep. But as soon as I get up in the morning with my breakfast in the car, everywhere I would take that script. And you get them, I think it was like a week in advance, something like that. Uh, so you'd have, you know, a little time to learn it. But that day, you know, changes happen. You know, you come in during the block, they'll say, well, that doesn't work. Let's do this. And you get some new pages. I remember my um, grandma Ada uh, on the show, there was one scene that I think she didn't like it. And they rewrote the whole scene. So I had to go in her dressing room and learn it literally an hour before we went on. Wow, and, totally from scratch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So these things would happen. But, you know, as an actor, you, you go with the flow and it, it, exactly. it's not... It's it's truly the norm, you know, because it's things are fluctuating constantly, and and it, it's part of the job. And um, sometimes that makes it very exciting, and sometimes it makes it very tense. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's it's always a changing day. I mean, especially for a specialized role, like you're saying, you know, something as a doctor, you're going to learn medical terminologies or technical yeah. terminologies, or uh, like you said, a courtroom scene that may be very specific things. Then if they get, if that gets cut or changed then you're like, wait a minute, I just learned all these words for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and we did have a, a, a medical technical person on the set. So he would help us get through those like surgery scenes and things. So <laughs> it would sound very accurate. That's great. So, I mean, it's been it's been really cool getting to know your acting experiences. But now let's talk about Russell Todd Agency and your choice <laughs> to step away from acting to work with camera operators and cinematographers. So how did you first find yourself immersed in that side of the world? Yeah, I never thought I'd be in that part of the world. But as I said, as I was kind of losing my love of, of you know being one person, then coming back here and doing started a few more acting things, including a, a commercial with Sharon Stone, which I'm very proud of. It's a scotch that only showed in Europe and Asia. If you were to Google Sharon Stone and the word scotch, it'll pop up. It's a black and white commercial. So I did that. And, and then I went on one more commercial audition and my friend Kirk uh, was behind the camera uh, you know, filming the audition. And he, he said he's where he was also working at this agency uh, that did below the line talent, uh, DPs, production designers, customers, editors. And they were looking for someone to assist the head of the TV department. And I thought, oh, I just came off a show and I don't know if I want to be an assistant. And then I said, but I said, but well, what do I want to do? You know? So I said, let me meet them. So I went in and I met the woman that owned the agency. She had just recently bought it. And I liked her a lot. She was a dynamic lady who owned a hockey team in Canada. She was Canadian. Nice. And, 
And she liked me and I went through the interview process with the agents and they hired me to be the assistant to the head of the TV department who did not want me there at all. She liked working on her own. She didn't want someone in her office. She didn't want to have to you know, delegate to anyone. She just wanted to do it all on her own, which I respected, but you know, they wanted her to have an assistant. So I did that. And literally the second week I was at the agency, I was at the front desk just answering phones. And a guy walks in and he said, uh, do you represent Steadicam operators? And I'm thinking, what's a Steadicam operator? <laughs> <laughs> at that point, I truly was not aware of, of everything. And um, I said, let me check. I'll get back to you. And I researched it and I found out that no agencies in the world were representing Steadicam operators. So I thought, I thought, let me start a division here. So I researched again and I, I found people. I called 10, I called a number of them, but I found 10 steady cam operators that were interested in having an agent, you know, for the first time. And all of a sudden we were getting bookings and bookings and I was handling that and being her assistant at the same time. And, and it was going well and it was growing and growing. And all of a sudden it was becoming one of the, you know, most important um, divisions at the agency making great money. And so about a year and a half into it, oh, well, first of all, um, the head of the T department for some reason, left the agency. So they moved me up to now run the TV department. So I was running the TV department and the Steadicam department. So it was an incredible amount of work. Um, and I was doing a commute an hour and a half each way to get there. So a lot of times I was just working on my cell phone in the car back and forth. So I would, you know, except for the times in the office. But so now I'm doing both. And I'm thinking, you know, I should just open up my own agency. I've been there a year and a half. So I decided to take just my Steadicam operators and have a niche agency. So I took those, and it had grown to maybe 15 at that point. I took those with me. And part of my deal when I signed to work there was I, if I were to leave and take clients, um, even clients I had brought, I would owe them, I think it was one third of what I made on them for a couple of years. So I had to do that, which was fine. I celebrated, believe me, after those few years and I was no longer paying them. <laughs> but um, I opened up the Russell Todd agency and it's grown now to like 50, 55 clients, uh, mostly in the US, nice. in Europe, and South America, uh, Australia. And it's the premier agency, literally, when someone wants a steady camera operator, they know to call my agency, which is fantastic. Um, a few other people now have steady camera operators, but they know to call my company. It's kind of like a one stop shopping for a steady camera operator or a drone pilot or a regular A or B camera operator. And um, and it's grown every year. Every year has been better than the year before. And we have a terrific reputation, which is nice. And I love the negotiating. Uh, you know, you, you are talking about money all day. I'm not screaming, show me the money or like <laughs> movies. But, you know, uh, but I enjoy it tremendously. Uh, and I love the clients. I, I There's so many different personalities also, which is terrific. You know, you get to learn all the idiosyncrasies of them like they do with me. And, and I have great connections in the production world now um, uh, from unit production managers to assistants to directors of photography and directors and studio people. So it's really, you know, kept me in the industry. And um, one of the great things I love is if I go to a movie theater and I'm watching the movie and, you know, five trailers, you know, come prior to the film. And I look at it and I go, you know, three of them we helped make, you know, and it's <laughs> nice. always, you know, it's a really nice feeling, you know, and just say, oh, yeah, we did that. So uh, I never knew my, you know, my career would go in that direction, but uh, I'm very happy it has. No, that's excellent. And it's uh, congratulations and also credit to you for doing that. I mean, it can be tough to start your own business in any industry, but especially in sure. entertainment. And you find, found a really cool niche to kind of just put yourself right in there and keep on building it every year. So that's, that's remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. So it's also interesting because agents, just the term is so closely associated with acting that not everyone realizes the other pieces of film and production, how other roles yeah. besides actors can use agents too. So can you talk a little bit more about how the representation works for the camera side as opposed to the acting side? Sure. And, and it's pretty much the same. Um, you know, as far as an agent, we not only get calls that come in, but we have production reports and, and hearsay and word of mouth and things we read in variety, every, you know, look online. Um, so we're also submitting all the time. So there's different ways, different avenues that uh, clients and are getting work and they're getting direct calls themselves. So they say, please call my agent Russell and, and we'll negotiate the deal. But just like an actor, you know, we get the call. 
And we, we, we learn the date. There are many key things and every, every job is different, but the, the key things are obviously the dates, the location, if it's union or not. Um, and then we, they'll throw a price out at us and we negotiate. We know what we've gotten from that studio or that network uh, for other jobs. We also know what some other people are getting outside our agency because a couple of us, the agents speak, of course. Um, so we're, you know, we try to stay on top of what uh, studios are willing to pay, how far they'll go. They could stretch it. And, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you win tremendously. You're just shocked that they've agreed to the deal. And other times, you know, it's it, it's not the money you've wanted, but perhaps it's the director you've wanted to work with and a, an actor you've wanted to work with, a writer, a studio. So we don't always look at just the money, although it's crucial to anybody, of course, but there's so many more things involved in it uh, with a project. And when when the client likes a project and they've read it, and they say, I want to be attached to this no matter what. We say, well, not no matter what. We, we know you don't want it to be taken, you know, to do this project. But we'll be sure it happens, you know, but maybe not at the rate that we're hoping for, but we'll get definitely get you the best rate possible. Uh, but we'll get you a board on it. So it's it's very fulfilling. Uh, you know, sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes you don't get what you want, uh, just like an actor for an agent. Um so uh, it's it's a bit of a game, you know, a back and a forth, but we do it with uh with calmness and uh, we never raise our voices or get involved. It's, it's, it is money. Uh, and it's not the problem. I'm, I'm negotiating with someone. It's not their money either. It's the studio's money, money and it's not my money. So we, we shouldn't be emotionally involved. And I think that's really the key to being a good agent is you don't get emotionally involved, be strong for your client, but uh, be even, you know, um, and let them know that, that you're strong, but you're not, you know, you're not losing it emotionally over it. So uh, it's, it's, it's an exciting, every call is exciting in a way. And mm -hmm. I, I really jazzed when, when my computer has my email on it and I see all the emails coming in and I have a two line phone and both lines are going and one's on hold and my cell phone is ringing and there's texts and all these people are trying to reach me at the same time to negotiate on one client or perhaps even the same client sometimes. And it kind of just fills me up, you know, the energy of it all. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's rewarding. That's great. And that's a good sign that's your, that you're where you're supposed to be when you get filled with that level of excitement, you're genuinely that's, that's enjoying yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. And a lot of it does, as you described, resonate with the acting world, whether, you know, sometimes it's just a certain opportunity you're going after and not necessarily a certain amount of money, something that might lead to, you know, working with this director could lead to getting yeah. into this studio. It definitely is along the same lines. Very much. I agree. Yes. Now, also nowadays, most uh, camera ops are freelancing and a lot of people are learning camera work on their own and, you know, aspiring filmmakers are filming and editing their own elaborate videos for social media. A lot of right. it is DIY. So what changes have you seen in the industry from when you started the agency to today? Well, I think exactly what you're saying is it's incredible how much freelance is out there. You know, people have such access to things um you know everyone seems to know somebody in a camera department somewhere or at a camera house and able to get something or somehow they'll be able to get something on loan uh, or whatever uh but if not they they i don't know, they, they get by somehow and, and and get a crew that wants to be you know involved in making a movie or a video i mean so many people still love this industry and want to be a part of it, whether they are now or they want to change positions in the industry. So when someone comes to you with an idea for a project, you get so much positive energy um, and people want to get involved and get it made no matter what it takes, no matter how long the hours, no matter how little the money um, on a personal level, you know, not, not a big studio thing, of course, but like we're saying, you know, someone that wants to just make their own project independently. But uh it's, oh, sorry, the phone's going to ring a couple times. Oh, no worries. I don't hear anything, actually. So <laughs> oh, you don't? Okay. <laughs> I will. Just I will. Okay. Um, but uh, I think, um, you know, with also with Instagram and TikTok and, and Twitter and everything that's available to us, they also see what other people are doing. It's in the palm of their hand 24-7. And that could be good and bad. But they see what other people are doing, how they're making product and so it inspires people to do it themselves. And, and, and you can easily ask people that you have no idea who they are, but you can reach out to them just by messaging them. So how did you achieve that shot? You know, what, what do you think about lighting or what lens should I use or anything like that? So there's so much that you can have, you know, at your disposal 
to make your own projects now. And uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful for the industry and it's wonderful for individuals just for their own sense of accomplishment and pride. I agree. And that's one thing that when it comes to entertainment, filmmaking, TV shows, any kind of format, whatever it comes in, whether it's literally social media, online, big studio production, I think that that spark of inspiration and creativity is always going to pull people towards it, no matter what format it's in or how you're making it. That's that's never going to go yeah. away, that human element. And that's a, an important topic yeah. right now, especially with all the AI talks and streaming talks that everybody's having right now. I think that, you know, that human element is important to remember no matter what. Yeah. And that's why the actors are out there striking right now. A lot of my friends are on the picket line. I'm going to join them uh, next week. And uh, because yeah, AI and, and streaming, all of these issues and, and, and their residuals are, are crucial to the actors. Yeah. Definitely. So also getting back to the topic of the conventions, you are, of course, known for making appearances at horror conventions, like we were discussing earlier about the sense of community. You've also done the events like the recent Hollywood show. So do you find mm -hmm. that when you have these experiences, people share memories of seeing your various roles? And what have been some of the more fun fan interactions you've had? Oh, wow. There's been so many over the years. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, I guess the one that stuck out the most, as I remember, I think I think it was in Chicago at a Day of the Dead. And there was someone standing not close to the table, but in between, there was a table. And then across the way, there was another table. So he was halfway between. And he was, I could see he had a binder full of pictures. And he was staring at me. I, I thought he was thinking, who the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> but he kept inching a little closer and people would come up to the table and talk. And we always do a selfie and, and, and do the signature and chat for a little bit. And he kept coming up, and but he was so hesitant. And finally he came to the table and tears were coming down his eyes. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, I, I'm just so scared to meet you. Uh, it is very difficult. And I, I, I hugged him. I came around the table and I said, "There's no reason to be scared at all. This is, you know, there's nothing different between you and I except what you know what I'm doing here." I said that, you know, and I remember him just sobbing, and I said, "Just relax. Just let's talk." And we we talked for a little while, and eventually he calmed down. But I could just see his chest like going like this from from the nerves, and I was so touched by that that. It meant so much for him to be there to see myself and many others, I'm sure, that day. But he was, he was, he was so moved, no matter what the emotion. Uh, yet he still had the courage to get there, which I thought was great, and and to inch his way up to the table uh, to speak to me. But I just thought it was it was very endearing and uh and sweet and and human and 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 wonderful and and i was so glad that he did you know come up and so we could talk and i could you know comfort him and tell him there was you know nothing to be worried about at all or or fearful i mean look i i'll see a celebrity and and you know i'll be a little nervous going up to them i you know as well but you know when he broke into tears that really it, it concerned me so that's that I will always remember, and that sticks out the most. But overall, people are just so full of energy, and they usually know more about sometimes my life, but my characters, <laughs> movies, the history of a character. Even with Dr. J.B. Frame on Another World, you know, I was the 10th guy to play Dr. Frame. And um, people would come up to me at the studio in Broken Lily when I was leaving, and they would, they would ask me, some people ask me medical questions. And oh, I would wow. say, you understand, I'm just playing a doctor, you know, I appreciate it, but I don't know the answer to that. But they would tell me backstory and stuff because they're faithful fans. So the same when they come up at the fan conventions, they tell you stories about, um, did you know when in, in part seven this happened and this or on your soap opera, did you know that this person was really related to this person? They have so much information, which is just mind boggling and, and fascinating. And uh, it's it's kind of cool the, how much energy and effort they put into into what you do and um, and who you played. So yeah, the conventions are great because I mean, look, we wouldn't be there if there weren't fans watching the product. Of course. And they truly uh, love getting a chance to meet you. And I love, I go around too. Uh, Donna Mills was at the last one and I had done a TV movie with Donna uh, many, many years ago. I had a tiny little part and uh, she was at a table and I went over to her and we talked for a while and I was like, you know, fanning over her to you know, <laughs> see her again and, and some other people. So I, I I enjoy the conventions too for that chance. So I get to see people that I've watched on TV and movies over the years. 
That's wonderful. I mean, it all comes back to that human connection. You know, that's yeah. people who are in the entertainment industry are also fans of other people in the entertainment industry. Exactly. We're well. all the same. <laughs> exactly. Totally. That's great. So do you have any upcoming appearances or projects to promote right now? Well, funny you say that. Um, not an acting one, although I would love uh, if there was someone interested in, in hiring me again as an actor, I would definitely consider it. So um, I am open to that for sure. But I'm being serialized in a book. Um, someone had bought the rights to, oddly enough, another horror movie. And I can't say the name of it now, um, but they're going to make me, I mean, obviously the characters were already created from the movie because it's been out. But um, my face, literally me, is going to be that character. They changed the book to be my face. So I'm going to get a chance to do that. And they've you know, photographed and artist sketches have been done. And we're refining them right now. So you're and, back to modeling, basically. <laughs> yeah, just kind of modeling. Yeah, yeah. It's illustrations, which is which is cool. Um, so that is going to happen. We're, we're figuring it out right now. But it's just the very early stages of it. So that's coming up. I also have an Instagram account at Russell Todd LA that people are interested in connecting to that. Um, uh, there's a possible convention in Texas uh, at the beginning of next year. And uh, in New Jersey, there's a big one called Monster Mania and, and also Chiller, which I'm hoping to do in 2024 as well, because I haven't done either one of those. And I'd love to meet the people in Jersey. Um, and I was invited to do one in Germany but unfortunately, I, I just got back from Europe, as, as I had mentioned to you prior to us starting this interview, and my passport's expiring. So I had to uh, send it in. It takes even oh. expedited two months to get it back. So I can't do the one in Germany. I've got to wait for a new passport. But they, you know, they, they pop up. People contact you. I have uh, some people that will watch out for me as far as the, uh, the conventions. And, uh, and there's always more ahead. Excellent. Well, that's great. Lots of stuff to look forward to and a fun new project you've got in the works there. Can't wait to hear what that one is for the uh, yet to be named horror project. I guess we'll find that out through your Instagram. <laughs> yep. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Russell. It's been really fun learning about your experiences, both in front of and behind the camera. So thank you for taking the time to share. Thank you, Chelsea. I really enjoyed it. It was a pleasure.